And thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 68, Greek Fire, part one. By the middle of 1939, British attempts to diplomatically separate Italy and its fickle leader from Germany had run its course with little to show for it. But during Britain's attempts at clever diplomacy, it seemed to Metexas and his country that, quote, Britain had no particular use for her small and loyal friend, unquote. And mostly, they were right. But Mussolini had thrown in his lot with Germany, and the lines were drawn. So London was back to square one, looking for allies. In a gesture that was more of an apology rather than substance, in July of 1939, Britain loaned Greece two million pounds sterling for rearmament. This may sound impressive, but it was only a drop in the bucket for what Greece needed, and the UK knew it. However, in the end, even this gesture really didn't matter. Metex has found getting deliveries from the UK was practically impossible, as their home island was rushing to beef up its defensive capabilities. Still, it was the beginning of a long political dance with a goal of standing together. Another step forward for the improvement of Anglo-Greek relations was the new British minister to Greece, Sir Michael Ballaret. Appointed in June 1939, Metexas was at first not happy with this Roman Catholic in his capital. But Ballaret would become a staunch ally, believing in the Greek cause and its people. A case in point, on October 16, 1939, Metexas and Ballaret signed a temporary war trade agreement. The idea was to reduce Greek trade with Germany. But at best, it was an imperfect agreement. The Greek merchant fleet was privately owned, so Metexas had little direct control. Also, Britain didn't help in that there were so many conditions for Greece to meet that they continued selling much of their agriculture to Germany. Greek trade was also hurt by the British as they violated Greek waters and airspace. And although the British were far from callous, their excursions gave the Italians an excuse to do the same. However, the British were more reserved in their seizures or inspections. The Italians simply overtook a Greek vessel, boarded it, and stole what they wanted. It also didn't help Greece that both countries had a naval blockade set up against the maritime country. With hindsight, we now know that although Britain was past the point of throwing over Greece, if it would have separated the two dictators, their assistance to the beleaguered Greeks was still self-serving. In whatever form of aid Britain brought to the eastern Mediterranean, Crete had to be a part of it. Its proximity to the Suez Canal demanded no less. As bad as this looked on the surface, the root cause would have hurt Greek pride even more. In April of 1940, Metexas asked Britain for a military alliance. The answer was no, based on Britain's and others' assessment of the Greeks' military. Why ally with and militarily support a country that at most would only slow down Axis forces for a few weeks? Greece would fall, but Crete would not. The British military would see to that. When Norway seemed on its way to becoming another German victory by the end of April, rumors were rife of an Italian attack on Greece. After all, the Allies were committed further north and not faring well. Days later, on May 3rd, ten classes of reserve officers of all arms were activated in Greece. Internally, Greece was improving its defense, but it still needed Britain. So, two weeks later, on May 17th, Metexas formally allowed British Admiral Cunningham permission to use Greek ports. Cunningham had been using Greek ports already, without asking. But the Greek Prime Minister was looking for any positive coming together between Greece and the United Kingdom, politically. Also on that day, General Papago, the Texas Chief of General Staff, asked for permission to start a general mobilization. But that was going too far. But Texas would defend Greece 
but he would do nothing to give Mussolini a reason for doing something he clearly wanted to do already. It was a fine line for the Greek leader, and it was only getting thinner. In mid-May, the Greek Prime Minister asked Britain again for an Anglo-Greek alliance. He wasn't told no, but he wasn't told yes, either. Regardless, the desperate Greek leader pursued a pro-British policy. Why? Well, he really didn't have another choice. When Metexas was asked by any other country of Greece's intentions, he simply replied, Greece would fight for her territorial integrity. To say any more was to invite trouble. But, hoping against hope, on June 4, 1940, Metexas sounded out Germany on possibly intervening between Italy and Greece. The unofficial response was a quick no. After all, Hitler had already told Mussolini that March that, quote, Italy would be the mistress of the Mediterranean, end quote. But some of the young pro-Nazi men in Athens didn't know that. Some were already calling for the removal of Metaxas, thinking that if Italy dared to move against Greece, Germany would surely step in to prevent it. Thus their collective mindset, fearing the probable invasion, convinced themselves all would turn out for the best. However, the pro-British Greeks on Crete were reacting differently to the building tension. They were threatening to defect to the British. If this disintegration became real, Mussolini would have the excuse he needed to invade. He would claim Italy had intervened for stability and security, and Greece's division would further weaken their ability to resist. But Greece's course was set. At the end of June, Metexas had a former pro-German minister banished to an island. But the momentum didn't stop there. A week later, the Undersecretary for War, Nicholas Papadimas, sent the Prime Minister a pro-Axis memo. It basically said to stop all preparation to defend against the Axis, and instead accept them. And to prove Greece's loyalty to their new master, the memo also demanded that the Greek government remove all pro-British ministers. Unexpectedly, Metexa submitted the memo to his cabinet to be discussed. If there was ever an opportunity for an out, this was it. But the men in the cabinet saw the same realistic picture that the Prime Minister did. After the meeting, arrests of pro-German politicians and civilians began. This July 12th purge, as it became known, surprised London and Sir Michael Palare, but less so. Early in July 1940, Mussolini felt it was time to take Greece. After all, the war in France ended too quickly for Italy to really benefit. That, and Hitler had said no to Italian ambitions in southern France and North Africa. What's more, Athens was also supplying British forces in Egypt with ammunition. Still, a proper form for invading a non-threatening country had to be observed. In August, the propaganda war against Greece, but mostly Metexas, started. Italian radio and newspapers were full of horror stories that Albanians in Greece were being harassed and abused. This, Mussolini, as the protector of Albania, would not tolerate. The next step, of course, was for Italy to make outrageous territorial demands of Greece, and if Metexas did not comply then Italy would have no choice but to take it all. But then came the attack on the vessel Ella off the island of Tinos, which we have already covered. What was supposed to be an Italian ramping up of diplomatic nerves, followed by Greek capitulation of key territory, instead became a mostly unified Greek wall of defense. And Mussolini, although never saying it out loud to Ciano, knew a mistake had been made. It would have to be force, total and overpowering. So, the rhetoric was turned down to lull the Greeks into a false sense of normalcy, and the Italian armies in Albania were reinforced. But it wasn't going any better for the Allies. Greece once again 
asked for German intervention, but this time was told no, open and with malice. As for the British, Greece's lukewarm ally, after Sidi Barani was seized by the Italians, the Egyptian government reneged on its 1936 treaty and refused to declare war on Italy. Minister Ballaret did what he could for Greece, but London saw the situation differently. With Lord Halifax leading the way in thinking Greece's defense inept, he pushed through his agenda that saw Turkey remain the favored Balkan country in receiving British supplies. But London did make one rather self-serving concession to Greece. It was decided to send a small force to help protect Crete. That this helped to secure Egypt did not go unnoticed by Metexas. But what could he do? Now we come to an issue of some controversy. On October 4th, Mussolini and Hitler met at the Brenner Pass to discuss the future. Hitler mentioned that, regrettably, Operation Sea Line had to be postponed. So now, it was time to apply a peripheral strategy to the British Empire to bring them to their senses. Conversely, the British were trying to do the same thing to the German Empire. Hitler then turned to bringing in Spain and the French Navy to help with this new strategy. Mussolini would need to do his part to convince the Spanish. Hitler would work on Vichy. This meant, of course, changing their attitude and actions towards the unoccupied French. And that change was seen by Hitler as a sound investment. Mussolini, who didn't get what he wanted in the first place from France's demise, probably wanted to move quickly beyond this point and agreed to woo Franco. Now, the debate, or rather, the opportunity to disagree. Since the war, most historians agree that Hitler did not know of Mussolini's true intent towards Greece. And the offended fascist leader wasn't going to shed any light at this point. However, Martin Van Creveld, in his book, Hitler's Strategy, 1940 to 1941, argues that Hitler not only knew the details of Mussolini's desire, but that they discussed it in length when alone at Brenner. Mussolini, after all, spoke decent German, and they didn't always use a translator. So, we may never know if attacking Greece was decided jointly but we do know that Hitler failed to mention his intention towards the rump state of Romania. In fact, even then, German troops were massing and would move into Romania on October 7th, in three days' time. And although Creveld focused on Germany's foreign policy in great detail in preparation for his book, one can't help but offer up Ciano's diary as a counterweight to what may or may not have been said between the Axis leaders. And as for this meeting at Brenner, Ciano notes that on this occasion, Mussolini, although resentful that Hitler did most of the talking, was not put out. In fact, to his son-in-law, he seemed in good humor. Most people now think that's because, at this point, he had made up his own mind to take Greece. It was just a matter of when. And one can easily imagine Il Duce giggling to himself at the thought of not telling his Axis partner, who prattled on and on. Hitler did mention the strategic value of taking Crete in regards to Mussolini's struggle with the British over the Mediterranean. And perhaps this explains some of the confusion of how much Hitler knew and supported his partner. Hitler's concern at the time, besides protecting Romania, was keeping the pressure on the Yugoslav government under Prince Paul. Yugoslavia was close to signing the Tripartite Pact, and the assumed invulnerability of the Pact of Steel was the pressure Prince Paul felt. Nothing could happen to disturb that belief. But the best evidence against Creveld is another Chiano diary entry that showed Mussolini's reaction when he finally heard about German troops advancing into Romania even though they were there to protect the Ploesti oil for the Axis. Mussolini, now letting his frustration show, said, quote, I will pay him, Hitler, back in his own coin. He will find out from the papers that I have occupied Greece, 
In this way, the equilibrium will be re-established. End quote. After all, Hitler had set the precedent of acting without notification. Finally, Hitler had been consistent in his stance that Germany did not see the Balkans as a part of his greater Germany. Really, it came down to the Balkan countries supplying vital raw materials to Hitler's war machine. Nothing could be allowed to disturb that either. Either way, on October 13th, Il Duce ordered Marshal Bagdolio to prepare an attack against the entirety of Greece. Two days later, Mussolini met with his council of war at the Palazzo Venezia. With Mussolini were Bagdolio, Francesco Iaconomi, the Governor General of Albania, and General Sebastiano Visconti Prasca, who would be in overall command of Italy's latest conquest. Strangely, the Navy nor the intelligence branches were represented. This would haunt Italy in the near days to come. Hey everyone, Ray here. History is replete with humans overcoming adversity. Yet one of the most horrific disasters, and those that it affected, has largely been forgotten. That being the Great Mississippi Flood. From Wondery, American History Tellers is a podcast that explores extraordinary events from our nation's past and brings them to life. And the story of the Great Mississippi Flood launches their new season. In the summer of 1926, the American Midwest experienced rainfall like no one could remember. And all that water had to go somewhere, that being the mighty Mississippi. By the time the rain stopped, some 27,000 square miles were underwater. Crops were destroyed, getting around was practically impossible, and hundreds of farms and entire communities had been washed away. This included now 600,000 homeless Americans and another thousand dead. And when you add on the racism, exploitation, and betrayal that followed, the American landscape would be changed forever. Listen to American History Tellers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. General Prasca confidently and vaguely told Mussolini that he could not think of any reason that the attack should not go forward or not be successful. He outnumbered the Greek defenders facing his forces two to one. He saw the battle as unfolding thus. Phase one would see the seizure of the southern Albanian coastline, which would lead to the occupation of Zanti, California, Corfu, and Salonika. Phase two would consist of taking the rest of the Greek mainland. One can only imagine the response if these kind of generalizations were uttered in a German staff meeting. However, Mussolini seemed content. But then the aged Marshal Bagdolio spoke up. He agreed with Mussolini that Britain was too involved in Africa to help the Greeks in any real way. But just to be sure, all of Greece, including Crete and the Peloponnesus, should be occupied. And all that, according to the marshal, would take 20 divisions. Since there were only nine infantry divisions and one cavalry division in Albania at the time, clearly more men had to be moved up. He guessed that three more months would be needed to get the required men in place. To note, Bagdolio would stay skeptical of the entire operation, but when he passively threatened to resign over Greece, Mussolini let it be known that he would readily accept Bagdolio's or anyone's resignation if they were afraid of the Greeks. Now, Mussolini spoke up. He said, considering the time of the year, they had to move quickly. Then, looking at Praska, he casually mentioned to the general that he should not worry himself too much about Italian casualties. It was better to start the campaign now and send in reinforcements as they became available. Based on this line of thought, it was decided that, eh, five or six divisions would proceed through Iperos and then on to Athens, thus cutting the country in half. Mussolini specified that he wanted Iperos under Italian control by November 10th 
or the 11th. That would give them more time to move men into place. But even if Mussolini had been concerned about the season or Italian casualties, Prasca would have insisted on moving now, before reinforcements could be gathered. Why? Simple self-preservation. As the leader of two army corps, Prasca, under Italian regulations, would now be qualified for the rank of full general. And Prasca was barely holding on to his current position and rank. In fact, he had just survived an attempt by other officers in the army to oust him. If he became a full general, he could protect himself and begin to gather adherents. It seems that the infighting among Italian high-ranking officers was far more fierce than against a foreign enemy. Prasca knew that if more forces were brought in before the fighting started, the command would have been split, and thus the chance for promotion would vanish. Lastly, Mussolini knew of the infighting and encouraged it to a certain degree. Let those who really wanted to fight for Italy fight for the privilege. So Mussolini stepped in and saved Brasca and let the grateful general know who saved him. Mussolini then wrote to the rescued general, I believe events and above all, your actions will justify me. But even before Mussolini's chance came to keep up with Hitler in this game of one-upsmanship, the wheels started coming off. Three days after Mussolini's Council of War meeting, Bulgaria, in the form of King Boris, stepped back from his promise to participate in the invasion of Greece. His argument, besides claiming their rearmament schedule was behind, was that any action on Bulgaria's part might trigger a response from Turkey. And if the bulk of the relatively weak Bulgarian army was engaged in invading Greece, its borders and cities would be open to Turkish forces. Mussolini's reaction was to call Boris a gutless royal. However, the plans nor schedule for the invasion were altered. If Metexas needed any more proof of Italian intentions towards Greece, he received it on October 9th. Now that German forces were in control of what remained of Romania, Bucharest informed Athens they would no longer be selling their oil to Greece in the future. As shocking as this news was, it was more than matched by desperate Greek diplomatic wrangling between October 9th and the 28th that in the end gained them nothing. Greece asked the U.S. for help, but they, along with everyone else, predicted a quick Italian victory. And the U.S., like everyone else, was dealing with the reality on the ground, not principles. Greece then asked London if it was okay if they tried to order aircraft, Greece's main weakness, from the U.S. Britain said no, as they might end up receiving fewer aircraft at a time when they were trying to make up their losses during the Battle of Britain. Then, in an attempt to mollify Greece, Britain said it would be agreeable if they ordered aircraft from Germany. Germany, as we have seen, said yes, but never delivered the first plane. Then Greece tried again. It had nothing to lose for German intervention. But the only response received was an offhand piece of advice to capitulate if war happened to come. So the stage was set. Now that everything was clear for the invasion, Mussolini needed to make sure that there would be no blowback from his stronger partner. So, on October 22nd, Mussolini sent a letter to Hitler, letting him know of his intentions towards Greece. But, in a little bit of old-school chicanery, he backdated the letter to October 19th, as if Hitler was being given even more of an advance notice. Of course, the actual date when the hostilities would begin was conveniently left out. To wrap up this part of the story, Hitler, still in France at the time, read the letter on October 24th. He then requested an urgent meeting with his Axis partner. One can imagine the panicked tone in Hitler's request, causing more giggles from Rome. Mussolini let it be known that mm, he should have some free time, say, October 28th. 
So, when Hitler's train pulled up, Mussolini was there to meet his friend, yelling in lusty German, Führer, we are marching. This morning, a victorious Italian army has crossed the Greek border. Huzzah! Or whatever the Italian version of that is. But here's how it played out for the Greek leader. At 2 a.m. on October 27th, Metexas was awoken and told that Italian news services were reporting that Greek bands had moved into Albania and were attacking Italian outposts. It was Poland, September 1st, 1939, all over again. For the next 24 hours, more reports were circulated by the Italian news agencies of Greek atrocities. Mussolini now had his excuse. On October 28th, at 2.50 a.m., Emmanuel Grazzi, the Italian ambassador to Greece, was knocking on the Texas door. The prime minister lived about 15 minutes away from Athens. The prime minister let him in and was handed the ultimatum. In part, it read, quote, Greek neutrality has become more and more a pretense. The responsibility for this falls primarily on Great Britain. Unquote. The note went on to say that unless Greece turned over key areas to Italian forces, Italy will attack in its own defense. When the disheveled prime minister asked which areas were requested, Grazzi had to admit he did not know. Really, it didn't matter. Either way, the Italians were coming. With tears in his eyes, the Greek leader said, Allo, c'est la guerre. Well then, it's war. Grazzi could only reply that war could be avoided if the Greeks did not resist. The Italians would cross the border either way, three hours hence at 6 a.m. Metexas then mumbled a half-response about not being able to confer with the king in time, as well as contact the necessary military leaders in the field. He then showed the Italians the door. Once alone, he called the king and his army chief of staff about the ultimatum. By 5 a.m., Metexas was dressed and meeting with his cabinet. Then the extraordinary happened. The prime minister asked if anyone wanted to resign. He was met with defiant silence. Then, after signing the orders for a general mobilization and saying, God save Greece, he let it be known that, Although he held the main cabinet post so far, the ministers assembled now had full reign of power in their respective duties. They were to work together to defend Greece and consult with him only as needed. That morning, Metexas and the king toured Athens and made speeches. Metexas ended a radio address with the words, Fight for your country, for your wives and children, and for our sacred traditions. But the words, as moving as they were, were unneeded. The people at this point could have not been more behind their government, the king, or the church. Men grabbed whatever motorized transportation there was at hand, or simply started walking towards the front, firing their weapons in the air. The women and children gladly turned over their pack animals to the men to hurry them along. But Texas' response to Grazi since then, has morphed into legend. Every country is guilty of this. Now when Greeks talk of this event, it's simply referred to as the Ohi, or No, and is celebrated every October 28th as the anniversary of the No. So, before the British General Richard O'Connor in North Africa, before the Russians in the East, or the Americans, the soldiers of Greece engaged the Axis forces on land. Now that we finally made it to the actual conflict, it's worth noting a few things. The Italians attacked as winter was coming on. Their raison d'etre was simply, Mussolini was trying to win in a spitting contest with Hitler. Therefore, his men were not marching with conviction, anger, or revenge in their hearts. But the Greeks were. The Italian generals could have been more professional and less concerned about personal gain. For example, and I've learned this in playing someone much younger than myself in chess, is that you play the board 
not the opponent. Give each danger more weight than it merits, thus coming to the battlefield fully prepared. It would have behooved the invaders not to think of how short this conflict was going to be, or how the Greeks were probably going to resist until an unknown line on a map was reached, and then capitulate. The statement made by Governor General Yakonomi of Albania when he said, quote, The Greek population as a whole does not seem inclined to fight, unquote, might easily be leveled against the aggressors. Additionally, the Italian military intelligence about Greek positions was a joke. Praska spoke in generalizations during his council of war with Mussolini, and Il Duce went along with the general's assumptions. After all, it was really what Mussolini wanted to hear. And finally, the criminal folly of ignoring the Texas military experience and reputation, no matter the meager resources of Greece, was astounding. After all, he did have over a year to prepare. The Greeks would try something in the name of defense. It was the Italians' job to find out what, and either thwart it before hostilities commenced, or incorporate a countermeasure into their overall strategy and tactics. Hey everyone, Ray here. We've all been there. Seemingly out of nowhere, you get hit by an unexpected bill, and your world just stops. When that happens, you panic, so it's hard to think, what are my options? Well, that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart is here to help. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt or help you survive that unexpected bill with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. And just know you are not alone. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers who are on their path to financial freedom with a fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows that you are more than just your credit score, which is why they factor in your income, employment, and other information in your loan application. That's how they get you the best deal. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. October 28th, 1940. Although Ambassador Grazzi told Metexas the Italians would be crossing the border at 6 a.m., the first units of the invaders came over 30 minutes before. It seems that even in invading a non-threatening country, the fascists couldn't keep their word. Then again, it may have been one of the few things General Prasca got right in matters of military deception. With war upon them, the Greek people not only supported Metexas, the Prime Minister's state security no longer had to hold their citizens back. Many Italians, although innocent of Mussolini's treachery, were arrested, and Italian shops and offices were vandalized. Like Metexas, who now looked like a great weight had been lifted from his shoulders, the people no longer lived in fear of the invasion. It was here, and their anger and sense of injustice was released. At 9.20 that morning, the airports at Pyrrhus, Athens, and Patra were bombed, but they were only a part of a handful of air raids carried out that day. Although the weather in Rome and Athens was a tourist dream in the beautiful Mediterranean autumn, along the Greco-Albanian frontier, it was a different story. There, the weather had turned ugly since the 26th. Intense and heavy rains caused the small rivers near the valleys, the ones in front of the Italians, to flood. Raging rivers and large areas of mud slowed down the oncoming Italian columns. Still, the slow-moving invaders came on. They pushed along the Epirus front, that part of Greece just south of Albania. 
to General Alexander Papagos, the Texas chief of the general staff. It seemed that the Italians had Ionina, the largest city in the Epirus area, as their goal. What Greek forces they met gave way, as if General Prescott's predictions were coming true. But still, the rain did not let up. Soon, other planned air raids were canceled, and tanks and artillery pieces were left behind. They could catch up later. But what the advancing units didn't know, what Prasca didn't know, what Mussolini didn't know, was that the Greeks were not cowering before the superior might of fascist Italy. The defenders, not bogged down with tanks or immense supply lines, were heading back to their defensive line. And it was located about 20 miles north of Ionina. Not that the Italians knew this. Meanwhile, thousands of more Greek soldiers were rushing to that same defensive line. For the Italians, things looked good. The weather was unfortunate, but Italian troops were pushing their way through the mountains, and Greek defense seemed to melt before them. As for the Greeks, the weather was equally annoying, but it affected their plans less. Yes, the Greeks had a plan, and several contingency plans as well made long ago. And they were about to introduce one of those plans to the Italians and to the rest of the watching world. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, sorry I didn't have a, an official Audible recommendation. Um, I went on to Audible and I researched Yugoslavia, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, everything I could think of, but there was nothing there uh, pertinent to the place that we're at in our timeline. So I just wanted to make two unofficial recommendations. Um, for those of you who are listening to Laszlo Montgomery's um, Hong Kong series, um, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot, and it reminded me of The Noble House uh, book by James Clavell, which is on Audible. It's almost 60 hours long. You can get it for free because it is one credit. So if you're interested in that, go to my website, worldwar2podcast.net, click on the Audible link and sign up for the 30-day the trial. Um, the other book I'd like to recommend, which is mm, kind of related to all this, um, it's called The Big Rich, The Rise and Fall of the Greatest Texas Oil Fortunes. Um, it deals mostly with the history of oil in the U.S. It's really fascinating. You'll, I've listened to it twice in Audible. Um, it really is an amazing story. It's an amazing book. They do branch out and cover different parts of the world, the Middle East and whatnot, when it comes to oil. I think you'll like it a lot. Um, so those are my unofficial recommendations. Hopefully I can do better next time. Um, I just want to thank a couple of people real quick for the donations. Um, let's see here. Regina B. from South Salem, New York. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Don G. from Hurston, Queensland, Australia. Thank you very much. And lastly, Philip L. from Sugarland, Texas. And yes, Philip, I got your message about the Battle of Britain. I did get bogged down. I certainly didn't intend to do a day by day uh, account of it, but I had some really amazing resources. And once I got into it, um, I think it I think it turned out nicely. But yeah, that was not my intent. And um, thank you for putting up with it. And now we're on to the Mediterranean, the Middle East. So hopefully, you know. Um, We'll, we'll be able to move on from there. So, but again, thank you for your patience. And lastly, I just wanted to say, um, I've received a lot of emails from you listeners over the holiday break, which is why most of you have not heard back from me because it's, it just takes a lot of time to reply to everybody because you want to say something, you know, in, individual to that one person. So I'm going through those as fast as I can. Um, but again, I just want to thank everybody who's listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it meets your needs. Um, if you've just found the podcast a month ago and you're flying through the episodes, or maybe you've been with me from the very beginning, I think I've been at this for two and a half years now. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you. For me, it's still a labor of love. I get excited about whatever is coming next. I get excited when the next book comes in the mail from Amazon. So I'm still having a lot of fun, and I just, and I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, taking this journey with me. 
and most of you write me that you're commuting to and from work, and hopefully this is making your travel a little bit better, a little bit shorter as far as uh, your conception of time. Um, if you're at work and maybe you're listening to it on your lunch break, um, or you're working in a lab somewhere, or you're working third shift at night and you're all alone and you're listening, um, again, I I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate it. And to all you truck drivers out there, I've gotten a lot of emails from you guys and gals, um, whether from Mississippi or Australia or anywhere in between. The idea of you going down the road listening is just very um, humbling and exciting for me. Um, I wish I could come out with an hour-long episode every day so I can get your journey off to the right start. Um, if they ever invent a pill where you, humans don't have to sleep, but yet yeah, don't get cranky, I will be the first one to take it. So I just want to thank everybody. Um, I've had a great time doing this. Um, hopefully we're going to be around for a long time. And I just re really appreciate all the emails that have come in. So I hope everybody's 2013 is nothing but smooth sailing. I will see you as soon as I can with episode 69, Greek Fire Part 2. And as usual, take care, everyone.